So we're pleased to have Simeon Phillips, who's going to tell us about the Davis Savage yeah. storage co cycle. So, uh, first of all, thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, you know, bringing us to this very beautiful place and for letting us speak on these you know, things that many of us like. So, uh, as I said, I'll, as the title says, I'll be talking about the contemporary storage co cycle, but uh, I will begin with just some motivation. And in fact, it will be very connected to what uh, Samuel was talking about. Uh, I was a little bit even worried that he's going to do a half of the first half of my talk. Uh, you know, not likely he sort of took a different problem. Uh, I also have to warn you that uh, you know the word infinite will only be heard in this sentence because I'll not be saying anything about infinite area surfaces. But uh, I do hope to uh, explain why uh, the result mentioned at the end by which I can ask it is true. So why, why is it that we can replace all for almost every A D by uh, actually something happening for every AD. But uh, I'll talk more about this when I get there. Uh, before this, so let's start again with the square, which we'll think of as the torus. And uh, we'll consider again the flow in the direction theta, which winds up in fashion like this. And uh, we're going to ask the following question. What happens when uh, you take a very long trajectory on the torus and you close it up? So uh, we'll think of this thing as happening on the C2 lattice in R2. So here's our flow, and it's going on for a very long time. And imagine this picture also going on on the torus. This thing is winding out around in a very complicated way. And uh, you stop it after some very long time t, and the end of the trajectory lives somewhere here. You pick one of these endpoints, say this guy, or say this guy. You close out the trajectory, and now you have a closed curve. Uh, so I'm going to denote this tip of the curve by gamma t. And uh, now you have a closed curve on this torus. And you could ask, what is its homology class? Like, how you know? That's one way to measure it. Uh, you know, it's a curve of length t, but you can ask, what's the length of this? So, uh, so what was the representative of this class in homology? And uh, you expect this thing to be of order t because uh, you've been running for uh, time t. And uh, I should note that I could have chosen you know, pretty much any of these guys, and up to some bounded error, I would get roughly the same class. And the question that's more meaningful is to consider this one. So, what is this thing? And if we introduce, so if we call this lattice vector, so this is zero, this is A, and this is B, then uh, you won't be surprised to find out that gamma T has coordinates T cosine theta and T sine theta. This is where this thing is lying. And the coordinates of one of these guys are going to be roughly the same up to you know, plus or minus some very small error, like over order 1. And when you divide by t, you can see that the 1 over t times this class will cancel. And so this thing will be roughly uh, sine theta, sine theta, actually just with an approximate sign. And the limit, these things are actually equal, uh, where I write two coordinates for the coordinates A and B. Think of these things as quality classes. All right, so uh, this question wasn't very difficult, but uh, how about we ask the following, which is a little bit more interesting. So uh, as you've seen, uh, it makes sense to always consider, to just normalize things and always consider vertical trajectories. So this is going to be our gravity. But, uh, instead of, but, but instead of consider a different torus, so now I'm not going to consider square torus, but rather some skewed lattice. So my drawings are not as good as square torus, but you can sort of get a rough idea of what this thing looks like. So you have this lattice. And now uh, there is no uh, particularly nice choice of A and B, the basis vectors. But you know, say you fix call this guy A, so you call this guy B, and you ask, 
in the basis A B, how does the homology class of gamma Q look like? How does it look as a uh, And so th this is now a much more meaningful question. So here, this is not just a rotated square. It's actually uh, a rotated thing that looks like this. So it's a par parallelogram that you rotate and you have this periodic structure. So uh, to answer this question, uh, it, it actually uh, makes sense to look at the space of all such lattices. And uh, it's a very remarkable fact that, uh, it's not, if you haven't seen it before, is that answering the question of the individual behavior of this single trajectory on this fixed uh, torus can be related to the behavior of a very different dynamical system. So you look at the space of all tori, uh, which we think of as H, the upper half plane. So you can think of the lattice being generated by, if you have your parameter tau here, uh, this is the lattice. And, but notice that we allow the thing to be rotated. So really, we're looking at the unit tangent bundle to H. Uh, so this is the space of all tori, of all marked tori. This is what uh, H represents. But if we look at the fundamental domain, so if we could forget about the marking and we just remember the lattice, uh, then we have to quotient by the action of SL to Z. And we get this fundamental domain. Uh, so we have this picture of this tooth that lies in the upper half plane. And this, for example, this lattice corresponds to some value of the parameter tau somewhere in here. And the fact that it had, it's rotated in some way, in fact, corresponds to some unit uh, tangent vector like that. And what we're interested in is trying to, uh, try, so remember, the question was how, how does this geodesic behave? So uh, one thing which at first might seem strange is uh, to apply the following transformation. So we'll take the transformation g lambda, which is going to be e to the lambda, it's the diagonal matrix. And we're going to apply this uh, matrix to this picture. And so what, what is this matrix doing? It's shrinking the uh, uh, vertical axis, the y-axis. This thing is getting uh, multiplied by e to the minus lambda. And the x-axis is getting expanded like this. Uh, so this is what's happening in this picture. What's happening here is that, so this guy, another uh, picture for this is that you really have the modular surface like this, so it's a compact surface, but it has these two special points corresponding to these guys. So there's a square here and a triangle, if you like. Uh, and so we're really looking now at what happens if you apply the matrix G lambda to this, this picture. In this picture, what's happening is you're really doing the geodesic flow on this surface. So you have a unit tangent vector, and you're flowing in some way, maybe you come back, and then I go there, and then after applying this G lambda, you end up somewhere right here. And uh, what does this correspond to in that picture? Well, I'm trying to redraw the picture. So our gamma of T now, let's say that we took uh, lambda, so I'm going to take lambda to be of order log so when you take e to the log t, basically you've brought th this vector now became length one, and so this thing, can, so this is g t g lambda the tip. Uh, but so th this seems uh, nice, but the problem is that the basis vector has changed, and uh, it has changed very dramatically because you've taken this vector and you've multiplied the x coordinate by some. Uh, Know, by e to the lambda and the y coordinate by e to the negative lambda. And so these guys now um, look something like this. They're very distorted. So you have g lambda of a, g lambda of b. Uh, but, but the lattice itself, so notice, uh, however, that the lattice itself did not, does not need to be very deformed. So if you apply this matrix, the lattice itself could be a perfectly nice lattice, even though this uh, matrix, this lambda could be rather large. So you still have some lattice. Uh, 
which need not look at all like this lattice, but it, unless it doesn't need to be at all uh, deformed in any way. So you can pick another basis. So let's call this A prime and B prime. And now what you have is a tr tr transition matrix. So you have this basis, G lambda of A and G lambda of B. And uh, so this is your basis. And you apply a transition matrix, M lambda, which brings you to this uh, basis A prime, B prime. And the point is that now this vector G lambda of gamma T is, in this basis A prime, B prime, is, it's a relatively small vector. It's, say, a vector of length 1. And so uh, the point is that if we knew what this matrix M lambda is, what, what's, how, how this matrix looks like, it's an integer matrix, or maybe I should say, M lambda belongs to SL2Z. Uh, if we knew what this matrix looked like, then uh, basically we would know that this uh, vector that we're interested in, gamma of t, is obtained by applying this matrix m lambda, or rather its inverse, to uh, a vector of not very big length in, uh, in this basis a prime b prime. And so we could, for example, diagonalize this matrix m lambda, and if it had some uh, specific eigenvalue, then basically this uh, vector gamma t will be oriented along that eigenvalue. So then we, we could estimate how, how this guy looks like in the space is taken. So uh, the, 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 the points that I want to uh, take away from this, so the, the sort of structural things that uh, will be useful for what I would like to talk about are the following. So we have this picture of the modular curve, and we think of each of these guys as a torus, and uh, we forgot the marking, but locally, if we fix a marking, locally near this guy, we always have an identification of all the markings. So uh, if you think of the, a basis sitting on top of this point, as you move around the loop in the stores and you get back to where you started, uh, if you locally, so it's this picture that you've seen in complex analysis probably, when you do analytic continuation, locally you can identify things. And if you keep doing it, when you came back to where you started, the identification is uh, between the new basis and the old basis is by some matrix M lambda. So uh, what the structure that you have is that you have this X, which is, uh, so the tangent space, as you saw uh, in the previous talk, is just SL to R on SL to Z. And over this object, you have uh, this bundle of so it's the first homology of, of the torus. So it, it's a bundle of Z2, uh, it, it's a bundle of just Z, Z2, the group Z2, but as you go around loops, things get glued in some uh, mysterious way. Well, it's not so mysterious, they're actually glued, so to each loop there corresponds an element in SL to Z, and they're glued exactly by uh, the matrix in SL to Z that you have. So, this is one piece of the structure, and uh, so this bundle, so th this is pretty much, this is a topological piece of the data, but there's an, an extra piece which is very important for what I'll be talking about, which is that if you look at this lattice, you can think of this as a elliptic curve, so this guy, if you think of this as uh, just a, a V1 surface on dimension 1, you have the natural homomorphic one form DC, which lives here. And so, uh, let me just write the data here. So we have x, x, and over this you have the bundle of, so now I'm cheating, I said homology, but I'm going to look at cohomology. And you have it with the z coefficients, but you can also consider the, the same bundle, but with complex coefficients. So I'm just going to denote it like this. It, it, it has the same structure, you, can, you still have the same local identifications. But now inside you have this uh, space, which I'm going to denote by H10. And H10 is the span. So DZ gives you a span, uh, a cohomology class, which you can. So if you integrate DZ, if you integrate it along the A direction, you get the number one. But if you integrate it here, you get the complex number tau. And so uh, 
the star as you see, it's moving in the upper half way. So this, these things, uh, this bundle H10 is not flat. It, you don't have these local identifications. It's actually moving in a very nonlinear way, and in a very interesting way in some sense. And so uh, what my doctor is going to be concerned about is how, how this thing behaves and uh, how can understanding this bundle can actually tell us something topological about this guy. So this is the setup in this uh, specific situation. So the point is that understanding the geodesic flow on this modular surface and how it acts, how, how this matrix M lambda behaves, will allow us to answer very basic questions, like the things that people ask for the elementary model. How does this trajectory gravity behave? So uh, the general setup is as follows. So you have flat surfaces which are just glued polygons. So you take something like an octagon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 it might be an octagon, but uh, yes, this is, yes. You take two uh, pentagons and say you identify them like this. Oh no, this is terrible. <laughs> they should be parallel. Yeah, they, they, need be, they, be, they need to be parallel as uh, some of you is correctly pointing out. So, so, yeah, so now this thing is identified with this. This guy, this guy is identified. So these two guys don't look parallel, but they should be. So should these two guys, and this should be parallel to this, and they should be glued together. So you get some surface like this, and the general situation is, so the totality of such things is usually called the strata, and so it's this letter H with index kappa. So kappa is a multi-index, so you have K1 up to Kn. These are singularities. So everywhere here you have this flat metric, and you have this form DZ. Uh, that I was talking about earlier, but these singularities are these home points where locally this form, if you write it out, this thing will look like it will have a zero. It will be a homomorphic form, but it will have a zero of order k1 through kn. All right, so uh, th this is the general uh, structure. So if you have these polygons and they form some uh, total space, which is denoted by HK, and you have an action of SL to R on this HK. And the action is just, so geometrically, if you just act by a matrix and SL to R, you act on these polygons. They get skewed in some funny way, but lines which are parallel will stay parallel. They'll have the same length. And so you can glue them together and get a new surface. And understanding this dynamics is somehow central to understanding uh, the, and understanding the dynamics of this action on this big space is important for understanding the dynamics of just you know, the vertical flow on a specific individual surface. But uh, the important thing is that you also have the same structure as before. So we have what people call the Hodge bundle. So I'm going to denote so the, This is the same object, but with different coefficients. So this is, the lattice is just above, so when you glue these guys together, you get, so you get a surface, so I'm denoted by S and lambda. This is a strata, and so S is a Riemann surface. And lambda is going to be a homomorphic one form. And, and so you have defined in this way as we had it in the upper half plane, you have the homology of this uh, Riemann surface. So H of T is just the homology of that surface, the cohomology. Yes. 
And inside H of C, you have, again, the space H10, uh, which is the space of holomorphic one form. So this is a Riemann surface. So inside the complex cohomology, you have the representatives uh, given, given by holomorphic one form. So this is a subspace, which again is moving in a very uh, interesting way. So it forms what people call variational fudge structures. And so what, the, what, what this literally means is that you have a bundle, a, a bundle which has this local identification between the fibers, and inside of it you have this moving uh, subspace, which is moving in some interesting way. And again, what's quite uh, surprising is that understanding this bundle, understanding the, just this flat connection, so I should have said, I still haven't told you what the concept of so the cycle is, but it, it's this thing, it's either of these three guys, is usually called the conservatory H cross cycle. So it's just the procedure by which you move uh, one basis you know, like near yeah. the other surfaces. So it's in some sense surprising if you think about it that you have this purely topological object and inside of it you have this complex analytic bag and somehow the behavior of this topological object is dictated in many ways by this complex analytic part. So, um, to, uh, to understand dynamics of this action, so one of the main goals is understand invariant measures. Because if you understand invariant measures, then you can say things about uh, the ergodic theory of these individual flat surfaces. Now, uh, to do this, you have to... Uh, measures on what? Uh, measures on the strata. So, so this is uh, some topological space. In fact, it has a lot of nice structure. And you have this action of SL2R on this uh, strata. And you want to understand what are possible measures which are invariant under this action. So understanding these guys will, uh, will tell you in the end things about uh, individual flat surfaces. And uh, so recently there has been... Uh, fair amount of progress in understanding this. And so th there's the following general theorem uh, of asking of Mirzakani, but to describe it, I first have to tell you about uh, local coordinates. So on this space, uh, on this trial, as I said, you can think of these things as locally as given by the data of polygons and how they're grouped. And so if you want to introduce coordinates, you can just think of the length of the sides so if you record all the lengths on the sides, and uh, the gluing is a, something that locally stays fixed. It's not, if you make a perturbation, uh, you're not really changing the, uh, you can still do the gluing as long as the sides, uh, as you prescribe the sides correctly. And so the lengths of the sides, you can think of them as uh, vectors in R2. And so, so obviously they, they have to have some restrictions. So the length of this side, so if you make the, the sum along this face, the vectors should sum up to zero. And also, this vector is constrained to be the same as this, this vector. So, uh, you know, you, you could do this, you call this in a complicated combinatorial way, but the nice way to say this in some uh, you know, invariant way, which doesn't depend on the choice of this decomposition, is that uh, near the surface as lambda, you can give coordinates. by the first cohomology group of this surface S. And so you have to take relative cohomology. And by R2, I just mean vectors uh, in R2. And where sigma is uh, zero, is the locus of zeros of lambda. Or the same thing as the cone points. So you could think of uh, having this surface and so you have these marked points. And if you can prescribe the lengths of all of these vectors, and so also as you go around the loop, prescribing these th things will tell you how the surface looks like. You, you will be able to unfold it and cut it into polygons and obtain a surface. So, uh, so locally, this gives you, 
give you coordinates, but of course you can see that if you start shrinking, for example, this vector, once it hits zero, uh, there's a degeneracy. But hitting zero is not the worst that can happen. I mean, you can imagine that you know, this complicated gluing can degenerate very quickly if you move around these vectors. But locally, in a tiny neighborhood, you have these coordinates. So uh, the theorem of estimate there's a tiny is the, the following. Uh, That, so suppose that mu is uh, an S of R invariant measure, so ergodic, I should say, on this trial on H kappa, then what their theorem says is that there exists, uh, so locally, so if you look at this measure locally, uh, there exists this subspace, it's a real subspace inside the real cohomology of this. Uh, surface, so in this coordinate. So notice that you only have, uh, I, I'm only taking one R here and not two. So there is the subspace such that uh, mu is a fine, it's basically an affine measure on EX and then, so you have this vector space which is just this guy, but you tensor it with R2, so you take now R2 coefficients. And so th this measure is basically given by a real subspace and by uh, some affine measure on that real subspace. So that's informally what their theorem says. And in fact, they, they've proven some stronger results, but uh, I don't really want to talk too much about them because they're not directly related to uh, what I'll be talking about. So, uh, one thing which has been uh, really important in also this work, but also in understanding uh, these things called Lapinov exponents. So I also hope to explain this two thirds that was raised uh, at the end of la the last talk. So this two, th two thirds is basically a Lapinov exponent of this anterior Jewish cosine. So uh, it gives you a rate of growth of some of these vectors. So I'll, I'll get back to that uh, in a moment. But the point is this: so we have. Uh, which, as I said, was HC or HR or HC. So this is a flat bundle over the strata. And uh, so, so by flat, I mean that if you take uh, a point, you can move, take any other nearby point, and there's a very canonical way to identify the fibers of this uh, vector model, or in this case, if it's C, it's C1. Uh, and so you can ask about uh, what are other bundles, what are the sub bundles. Invariant, which are invariant So uh, what, what do I mean by this question? Well, I'm saying that So you have this uh, vector bundle which lives over the space HK And you can ask what are the possible uh, sub-bundles inside of it So that when you move them using this flat connection when you move them along the SL2R orbits, uh, they, they're constant, they're not changing, they're the same bundle. So it, by a sub-bundle, I mean just an a sub assignment of subspaces above each point, and you get the same subspace if you move things around. Is this, do you understand what I mean by this invariant sub-bundle? So maybe, maybe I'll uh, try to make this a little bit but the subbundles have to be flat or not? Yeah, so uh, so if they're flat, they're necessarily invariant. But if they're invariant, they need not be flat. For example, there's the tautological, like the, the thing that gives you the SL to our action. That's invariant, but that's not flat. And so uh, the interest in these bundles is uh, really related actually to uh, trying to do this kind of classific measure classification or 
when you try to actually understand the fine ergodic properties of uh, these objects. So, so maybe uh, I should give a quick example, which is that of Dyson curves. So, uh, so these are the these are SL two R orbits. So, well, maybe I, I should just say the, the closed SL two R orbits. So you have this action of SL two R in this space, and in principle, it's it's like the irrational rotation on a circle. It, it has, you know, you can imagine uh, things, you know, in general being very chaotic, but occasionally you have these closed orbits, there are these special surfaces uh, which under the action of SL2R they basically come back to themselves so you get uh, these kinds of objects like SL2R want some discrete finite covolume subgroup which sits inside the strata. And so a lot of people have worked on this and most of, like many of the results uh, of, of the form that I'll be talking about have been due to Mahler in this case. And they're related to the fact that these uh, light mode curves, they're not just uh, these closed orbits, they, they have, they have, they correspond to Riemann surfaces. And Riemann surfaces are necessarily algebraic. And so, uh, you know, you can write them down with polynomial equations. And so then you can uh, appeal to a lot of theorems in algebraic geometry to study these things. And so using that, Moller and other people have shown uh, that these things have uh, have interesting arithmetic properties. And, uh, and, and so what I'll be talking about is some analogs of uh, these results. In, some, in fact, most of those results more or less uh, transport to the case of these uh, invariant manifolds. So, when you have this measure, uh, as I said, it's supported on this uh, subspace, and basically it's supported on a, a manifold, and uh, the support of this measure is called an affine invariant manifold. So, uh, all right. So basically, the theorems. Let, let me just uh, say the theorems, and uh, I'll explain what they sort of mean and how you can apply them. So the first one is following some simplicity. So it says that uh, this bundle of H, H1, decomposes as a direct sum of. So the only way you can have invariant sum bundles is as follows. So you have Pi is the sub vector bundle. SL5 invariant. WI are the vector space. And so all of these guys carry punch structures, which just means that uh, they have these holomorphic subbundles inside of them. And, and the, the fact is that any uh, other invariant. So that's all going there. Some bundle is has to be of the form. So you, the only way you can form invariant sub bundles is by picking subspace, sub vector spaces inside these WIs, and then you tensor them with VIs. And this is the only way that such a thing can occur. So this seems a little bit mysterious if you haven't seen it before, but this is basically, if you know, if you've done, if you've seen your presentations of finite groups, it's saying that any representation of a finite group splits as a direct sum of uh, irreducible representations. And these VIs, these vector spaces, are supposed to account for the possibility that there are several copies of the same representation inside. And so uh, this is, uh, this is kind of what the theorem is saying. I want to make two remarks which are important for applications, which, is, which are that uh, 
same, the same facts are true. So the same theorem is true, but for uh, for the for so they're true for any tensor power of of this vector bundle uh, H1. Let's consider the Zurich cycle. And so uh, this was for, so, so I, I should say that this was for SL2 invariant bundles. And it's also, uh, it, it's also happening in the measurable category. So these sub-bundles in particular, they're allowed to depend measurably on uh, the base point. So, and measurable is what you're facing when you're doing your graphic theory. If you try to uh, produce invariant sub-bundles, usually a graphic theory will give you something that, that is measurable. And, and so this decomposition is also a priori measurable. But the same theorem holds also for tensor powers uh, of this uh, H1. And the reason why this is useful is the following. So there's a corollary of this thing, which is that if you have, say, P inside H1, it's some SL bar invariant sub bundle. Then, in fact, it is so measurable. Some bundle, then, in fact, it is real and not And you might think that this is uh, not saying too much, but uh, one analogy which you can try to think of is if you know the proof of monster rigidity. Uh, when you prove, for example, monster rigidity, you get a measurable map between uh, two. Uh, this is say the, the Riemann sphere and itself. And you can you need to prove that this measurable map is not just uh, measurable, it, it in fact turns out to be real analytic. So uh, this kind of uh, result that something that is a priori just measurable has to be a real analytic. Uh, it's really like it's a very strong rigidity property of these bundles, which has uh, implications for uh, the dynamics. So now I can explain why is it that this particular corollary, so this corollary plus uh, the estimator is a kind of uh, measure classification. So uh, these things allow, uh, so these allow John Chaika and Alex Eskin to prove that uh, to show the following, to show, so I'm just going to say it first for uh, people who know what this means, that the Osceletus theorem holds for all flat surfaces. So this all uh, replaces what usually what before was almost every, and this is the analog. And uh, somebody else talked of when he said that you know some theorem was true for almost every AB. Uh, this these kinds of results allow you to show that it holds for all AB. And so what what is this Asselada theorem? Well, it's actually uh, the, it, it, to explain it, we just have to go back to the uh, question we started off in the beginning. So uh, remember, we're asking about the asymptotics of this cycle. So we had this flat surface, in, in that case it was a torus, and we looked at this uh, straight line as it was going around the torus, and we asked, what's the cohomology cost when you close it up? Well, if you uh, take a, a, a different flat surface, so this is where I, I'm not very good at drawing. So let's say you take like this, and you again launch this guy and so that's not very good uh, come back here so you can ask how does this guy wind around the surface, so now this is when you do the gluings, this becomes a surface of genus 2 and uh, if you ask this 
pair of gamma t. So the class and cohomology of this gamma t looks like this. Uh, th this is what it means for the oscillator's theorem to hold. It says that this gamma t looks like t times some class, uh, let, let me just call it c1, plus t to the lambda 2 times some class c2, plus and so on. So if you're on the surface of genus G, you'll have G terms, G homology classes. And Don't erase that because I have questions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so these uh, lambda i's, so the first one is just lambda 1, and each is equal to 1, and these things are called Lapinov exponents, and you'll probably see more of them uh, in the wind tree. Lectures. But, so by the way, this inequality, the strict inequality is due to Forney, and before it was, in some specific cases, it was due to Fitch. Uh, so these are the uh, numbers which govern the asymptotic behavior of this cycle. And the fact that you saw two thirds means that some lambda of exponent is two thirds. So the first one is, uh, say, one, but then something like, well, maybe not the lambda of exponent, but some expression in these numbers will lead you to two thirds. And the possibility to even compute these numbers is in fact related to understanding these kinds of invariant subbundles. So the only way to compute these, uh, these kinds of numbers is related to the complex geometry and to the variation of patch structures that happen here. Okay? So, uh, so these are, this is one class of uh, results that I wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah. So, uh, there's another theorem which I want to state, which is a corollary of uh, this kind of stuff. So again, this is most, so I won't say much. If, you, if you've seen uh, Muller's papers, you know where this is coming from. But uh, the fact is the following, that I find invariant manifolds So uh, when you look at them, they parameterize Riemann surfaces. Uh, whose Jacobians have real multiplication. Uh, so there are a lot of words here which unfortunately I can't explain, so Jacobians have real multiplication. Uh, and I, I need to tell you what the field is, and it's what's called, what, what's called the field of the fine definition of this fine manifold. So, uh, so what this theorem is saying is that these Riemann surfaces, which correspond to these invariant manifolds, are, have to have some extremely special and very rare in general arithmetic properties. Uh, what this specifically means is uh, a little bit more uh, delicate. So, you know, so I think some people in the audience know what this means. Others don't. If you don't, don't worry. It's not something crucial for uh, you know for dynamics. It's not something very special. So, uh, all right. So we have this uh, these semi-simplicity results. I should also mention uh, that the, the semi-simplicity the result that I had here, and it, which I you know, erased, which I shouldn't have, is that uh, so some people uh, so, so some version of this result would have followed if we knew that these uh, finite invariant manifolds are uh, algebraic, that they're given by polynomial equations uh, when you consider them in certain situations. But, uh, and by polynomial equations, I don't mean given by linear equations, but uh, in, in some very strong algebraic sense. And uh, this is currently not known, but in fact, this theorem, which I raised, but uh, this theorem is stronger than, than what you would Get if you have uh, the algebraic uh, fact, and also the algebraic fact. I think that you get that is you know, it can be deduced from this theorem. So, so, so you say the algebraic. So you know that all the Ackman manifold invariant manifolds are algebraic. No. So I, I think that I don't know this. Yeah. But even if we knew, 
the facts that would be implied by that oh, would oh, be weaker the, than the dynamical that. facts. That you're interested yeah. In. Yeah. So so the, the theorem that was here, <laughs> keep pointing at the end of the board, is that uh, so it, it's, it, it says more than what you would get. Uh, it says on, more in a certain direction. It doesn't say they're algebraic. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So uh, you could. It says more than the limits of simplicity. That's what I'm saying. So. Uh, Can I ask about the theorem that you? Yeah. So so uh, so you have a. So we, we start with H1, we decompose it as a sum of tensor products, where the first part is, is uh, invariant. And so we have these sort of VIs that we can identify. Yeah, maybe, uh, just, yeah. And, and then, and then uh, so then, then you say that any other invariant subspace can be, and th these come from having uh, a Hodge filtration. Or, yeah. yeah. So, th and then the, uh, uh, any other invariant subspace is made up of VIs, but the tensor WIs, which, but um, and that, but that is at the measurable level at that point. Yeah. So, so th this theorem is at the measurable level, but then the next theorem says that anything that's measurable has to be real on the. And how how is that proved? I mean, you said uh, to Yeah. So, so uh, it's not. I mean, there. Yeah. So I could say a few words about the proofs. Uh, so, uh, so so the proof I have. So this thing uses. Uh, basically, the curvature of patch bundles and random walks and a lot of analysis, and uh, the proof that uh, this kind of semi-simplicity implies that things have to be real analytic. So the proof of that uses dynamics. So you have to look at the contracting and expanding foliations, and so you get not just real analytic. In fact, you get something that's polynomial. So uh, in fact, you get that these bundles have to vary in some sense polynomial. And so, uh, but, but that uses dynamics and it uses the fact that, you know, you have this contracting foliation, expanding foliation, and you have to play some games with that. But it uses this theorem, which is proven by uh, completely different methods. So this theorem uses just uh, curvature estimates and uh, random walks. And the other one uses dynamics and expansion and contraction. And, and can you write down VIs explicitly or? Uh, no, so, uh, so I can sort of try to, uh, so the theorem that actually underlies all of this, which I have not written because so I'm assuming I'm already in the questions period. I guess. <laughs> Maybe I should say, uh, could, could I <laughs> just okay. wrap it up? Yeah, yeah, wrap it up. yeah, I'll wrap it up and then I'll answer your questions about this because I realize <laughs> that this is turning into a conversation. So uh, the, the point uh, that I was trying to make is that uh, we started with this relatively simple topological question, which is you know, I take a torus, you wrap uh, around the loop, and uh, you're working on a fixed torus or a fixed flat surface, but it turns out that it's very beneficial to consider uh, to start deforming this torus. And uh, in fact, the, the, the dynamics, this SL2R dynamics on this uh, stratum, is in fact very strongly constrained and it interacts a lot with the algebraic geometry and with the, uh, with the arithmetic of, uh, of these objects. And so somehow you can say a lot of very interesting things. In fact, a lot of very interesting things have been already said by McMullen, for example. And I think this is going to show up probably in the winter course. Because these L-shaped tables, they essentially come from uh, McMullen's classification. And, uh, and so these higher dimensional things also, uh, you know, they carry a lot of this arithmetic structure. What's lacking at the moment is good examples. Because all, almost all the examples are via covers. Uh, but uh, the point is that all, all of the structure theory kind of works, and uh, it's very powerful. And it, like it, it can already give concrete applications, like the fact that you also let this theorem hold for literally every flat surface rather than for almost every flat surface. So I'm going to stop there. Thanks.